Is that on? I don't know. Where's the on button? You're on. Cool. Apparently I'm on. Shake it off. Huh? All right. Cool. Guys, uh, so I have this problem uh, where whenever I get excited, I talk fast. And when I get nervous, I talk fast. And I grew up in a house of women. What do you want? I got a double mic? Oh, okay. And uh, I grew up in a household of women, so I talk fast anyhow. Uh, and if I intentionally slow myself down, my country accent comes out. So I don't know if we're getting a message like quickened by God or like some holy hillbilly today, but we're going to see what happens. Uh, for just a second, everyone close your eyes for me. Raise your hand. Admission to yourself. If you have ever felt worthless. Only time I'm going to do this, I promise. Keep your hand up. Everyone open your eyes and look around. You are not the only person to deal with that feeling. Okay. For just a second, close your eyes again. And I want you to dwell on the last time you yourself felt worthless. Maybe it was three years ago. Maybe it was last month. Maybe it was when you walked into this building today. When was the last time you felt condemned by that feeling? Tuck that away in your back pocket. I want you to keep that somewhere close. We're going to come back and revisit that feeling here in just a little bit. Okay? All right. Open up. We'll get to the Bible in a second. Let me give you a little background. Uh, so Jimmy uh, is doing this I Am segment. Anthony, a couple people have all pitched in, and I'm stubborn. Um, so I start reading through the Bible thinking Jesus says more than seven things about himself, right? Um, and they just don't say, I am, all right? Uh, and I get to one that strikes my interest. Like, if I told you all, um, man, I could really use a drink of water. I'm just, I'm going to collapse if I don't get some liquid in me. I told you I'm thirsty, right? Same concept, I just used in words. So I get to, I'm going to fall over my own shoes in a second. This is going to be bad. Uh, so I get to John 10, 17 through 18. Jesus is telling his followers, The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. A long way of saying... They can't take it. I'm giving it up. I'm the willing sacrifice. So then you've got to ask yourself, why? Why did Jesus, why is he willing to sacrifice himself for any of us? Why you? Why me? What was, what's the crux of it? And we tell ourselves, Christians fall in this really easy circle, guys, right? Um, Jesus loves us, so he died on the cross. Well, why did he die on the cross? Because he loves us. See the circle? Both statements are true, but it's not the whole story. Uh, so if I came up to Jimmy and I said, Jimmy, you look tired. Why are you tired? We just put on a 40 square roof. And I said, how do I know you put on a 40 square roof? Can you see how tired I am? But if he looked at me and said, well, let me go show you the roof. Fills in the gaps, right? So today my goal is to explain why Jesus is the willing sacrifice. We're going to go back through a bunch of the word. And I'm going to show you the roof. Because this story is so much bigger than just because he said so. All right, so first step, we're going to go back to Luke chapter 1. Fifteen, rather. I can't even read my own handwriting. So, um, if you've been around the church for any period of time, uh, Jimmy has covered in detail how Jewish tradition, uh, when we repeat things twice, 
That's our way of saying this is important. Pay attention, what I'm saying next matters. Okay? It's not just the same word. This isn't just a truly, truly situation. If I say the same thing twice, it matters. Luke 15, 1 to 10. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent once. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. And the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Twice. Different words, same point, we've driven home two different ways. This is important, I'm telling you twice, pay attention, this matters. One of you is worth every bit of what's to come. come Drive it home. So we know that Jesus is at least loving enough that he's willing to do whatever for any one of us. But why? Let's dig a little further back, right? So we go back to Psalms 139. 13 through 16. For you have created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. But this is like grumpy old man God, right? This isn't like Jesus. This is way before Jesus, right? Can we all agree that this whole book is Jesus? Amen. There's no Old Testament. There's no New Testament. There's just the Testament. Fair? And I can prove it to you, right? So if we step back into the book of John for just a second, you don't have to flip with me. We're just gonna... John 17. Uh, let's see. This is right after the Last Supper. Jesus is praying just when things have wrapped up. Uh, 1 through 5. Let's see. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Thank you, Jesus! Right? So, before the world began, right at the beginning, the same glory he had with God. So when we talk about Psalm 139, are we just talking about God the Father? No, no. So we have a God that is three parts in that knew you in detail before you were born. And let's follow that all the way to the end logic-wise, right? If I knew every detail of you before you were born, I knew your children, which means I had to know every detail of them before they were born. For me to know you, I had to know every detail of your parents before they were born. So at any given point, we can follow logic forwards or backwards, to know that from the time time began, Jesus knew every one of us intimately, in detail. He knew your weaknesses. He knew your strengths. He knew your joys. He knew the things that would upset you. He knew whatever would make you angry. In detail. Parents, how well do you know your children? Do you love your kids more 
the more you get to know them, like parents who have children who are like not like this old, tall anymore. Like they get a little older and they frustrate you and you get angry, but when you see who they are as people, when you see what they're becoming, don't you just fall in love that much more? Amen. Amen. Right? Yeah. So the plot thickens. We get a little deeper. Jesus knew us all the way back then. He knows us all the way through the end. And you do anything for one of us. But how long has the experiment been going? Let's go back to Genesis. All the way back. We're going to learn some Hebrew. This is going to be fun. First chapter of Genesis. You have all sorts of, in the beginning, God created, spoke. There it is. You see this in Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. 1, 3, 1, 6, 1, 9, 1, 11, 1, 14, 1, 20, and 1, 24. God said, there it was. We all know that the Bible wasn't written in English, right? Like, no one was speaking a Germanic language 6,000 years ago. The word we use in the original text, the Hebrew word, um, is, I'm going to butcher this, bere. And it means to create out of nothing. There was nothing there, and now it is. All right? And this is how we created all of the heavens and the earth and the fish and the seas and the stars and the sky and all of it. Spoke created from nothing. Until. That's not the whole story. Right? So we get to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. This is just symbolism. Formed, created, same difference, right? But it's not the same word. And it's not the same word in Hebrew. See, formed here is yeshar. Yeshar has a different definition. It's not created from nothing. Yeshar is to form, fashion, or shape, to be forged, usually from existing materials. You don't speak and forge something. You get your hands dirty. You get in the thick of it, right? So we know from, let's see, chapter 1, verse 27, God created man in his own image, and that God had to physically be present to play in the dirt. It was already there. So, in, in, in I can't prove, Jimmy and I have, have had conversations, he talks about butterflies at the well, right? Where you don't know it's there, but you just feel it's there. If Jesus was around since time began, if God has to take a physical form to forge mankind and his image from the dust, who are we talking about in Genesis 2-7? Who formed man? And I can't help but think that we've created five days of this stuff out of, out of thin air. And on day six, Jesus comes down to earth. And he just looks around. Until he finds a good pile of wet dirt to play with. And spends the next however long it takes in detail. That's not right. And start over. Because he knew the enormity. Psalm 139. We know the details before and we know the details after. What I'm doing right now matters. Because I know what's coming from it. Oh God, this has got to be perfect. Can you imagine the love that would go into a project that you knew the infinite outcome from while you were doing it? I can't draw stick figures. <laughs> Jesus shaped the entirety of mankind with all the love that only a God can possess. So knowing now that, that Jesus created mankind, formed, forged from the dust of the ground, in my belief, himself. He knew every detail about every man that would come from that point on fell so in love with the human race because he was so invested in it that he would do all of it for any one of us. 
I read just a little bit from that prayer just after the Last Supper, and I want to go back to it, uh, the last part of it. This is the last thing on Jesus' mind before he goes to the garden. Okay? We go to John 17, verse 20. First it was returning to glory in your presence, then he prays for his disciples, and then at verse 20, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known for, to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. From the beginning of the experiment with the formation of man, Jesus' last thoughts before he goes to the garden were to pray for you and to pray for me. Not the disciples, we got to them a second ago. Not, oh God, what do I do? This is going to hurt. No, his last act in complete human freedom was, God, take care of the ones coming after. I love them, God. Take care of the ones coming after. Jesus went on from there to the garden. And the book of John doesn't get into detail with it. But the tail end of Luke does, and it's going to be the last little bit of what I read. Luke 22, 39 through 44. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down, and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel of heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. In the book of Matthew, it describes this incident as taking hours. It interrupts three times at an hour break each time. Just to say, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. I can't help but think that wasn't the whole prayer. How does an infinite son pray to an infinite father? The entirety of time and the thought of nothing. But an hour, two hours, three hours is spent here stressing about it so much that he's sweating blood. And there's no scripture that backs it up, but I have to feel like it went something like this. God, if there's any other way to do this, let's do it that way. I don't want to do this. But if this is the only way, all right, let's go. Because I remember spending my time creating this. We started this experiment together. I gotta love them. I knew everything about every one of them right from the beginning, and I know what's coming now. God, I love them. And I know they're not all going to take it, God. Maybe, maybe it's just one or two, but if there's any chance, any chance of one spending forever with me, God, I love them. I've got to do it. And I imagine it gets personal. Because when you know everything and you're an infinite God, you can have personal talks. God, you remember the, the, the look on, on Jimmy LaDonna's face when they got married? Man, I love that. That can't happen if I don't do this. God, do you remember the, the first time, the first time that, that, that Bill put a needle in his arm? God, he's not going to have a chance of getting out of it if I don't do this, God. So God, if there's any other way to do this, 
Let's do it that way. But if this is the only way, I'm all in because I'm already in too deep. Knowing that in the beginning, there was a savior that loved you so much to spend his time crafting you. That loved you so much through everything that you were the first thing on his mind in the beginning and the last thing on his mind in the end. reason could any of us have to feel like we're not worth anything and Jesus felt like we were worth everything <laughs> so that's my challenge for you today really this when we started I asked you when the last time you felt worthless was Maybe you walked in today feeling like you don't have any value. Maybe you walked in feeling like nobody can love me. You don't know what I've done. Maybe you walked in saying, I'm just spent. I've given everything I have to give and no one gives to me. I challenge you to take this time to come up and lay that on the cross because every bit of that vanishes in the presence of Jesus. Amen.